Hello. Today, I venture to Lower Derwin Valley National Nature Reserve in North Yorkshire. As you can see, it's pretty scenic. But what is a National Nature Reserve? What does it do and why is it important? Well, this is probably the right place to find out. So I'll do that while you watch the titles. Right, let's start at the beginning. Ish. In 1949, the UK government passed the National Parks and Access to Countryside Act. This allowed the UK's conservation organisation of the time, the Nature Conservancy, to designate areas as national nature reserves. These areas would protect the environment and function as outdoor laboratories for conducting research. The first national nature reserves were designated in 1953. Today, there are 224 in England, covering 94,000 hectares of land. But what do national nature reserves do today? Have they stayed true to their original objectives? I asked Senior Reserve Manager Craig Ralston. National nature reserves can be important for a whole host of reasons. Obviously, they're sort of ecological conservation importance, so they can be kind of biological hotspots, if you like. Places where we can kind of maintain populations of rare and unusual and even common species. So hopefully we can repopulate the rest of the countryside from these kind of hot spots. But not only are they important from a sort of ecological point of view, they can be places of important history, archaeology, they can be iconic landscapes, and they can be really important for people as well. Right, that's the broad aims of National Nature Reserves. What actually goes on day to day? Let's take a closer look at the Lower Derwent Valley, starting with land management. The Lower Derwent Valley contains the largest floodplain meadow in the UK. It's full of various grassland habitats, including the rare and snappily named MG4 grassland. This vast floral resource is valuable in its own right, but also important for pollinating insects in spring and early summer and great nesting habitat for breeding waders. Come July, the meadow is cut for hay, continuing traditional management that dates back around a thousand years. It's a fine balance between leaving the meadow long enough to flower and set seed, and cutting when the hay is at its most economically valuable. Some patches of meadow are cut for use as green hay. Green hay is laden with wild flower seeds, and used to establish new meadows elsewhere. We'll learn more about the process in a later episode. Management of the reserve is not without its challenges. There's a need to tackle invasive species such as Himalayan balsam, and also the native marsh ragwort, which is removed as it's toxic to animals if left within the hay crop. Control of these plants are labour and capital intensive, but essential for the management of the site. The reserve is still used for research, one aspect of which is bird ringing. Every year, young and adult birds, such as those in the heronry, receive a numbered metal ring and a tag from highly trained ringers. Members of the public, with sharp eyes or a decent pair of binoculars, can read the number and report it to the British Trust for Ornithology. This builds a picture of the bird's movement once they leave the nest. A similar process takes place for the many migrants passing through the reserve. An offshoot of research is distributing environmental information. At the reserve's Bank Island Centre, a wildlife garden is open to the public. Its aim? To demonstrate wildlife-friendly techniques that people can try at home, ranging from planting nectar-rich flowers to building an insect hotel. But the reserve isn't just good for nature, it's also good for people. We learned in a previous episode that nature is good for your health, but it can also be good for your education. The reserve acts as a useful base for engagement with local schools. As an example, students from the Ad Astra group built an insect hotel, which has already been occupied by leafcutter bees. A regular team of volunteers attends once a week to carry out practical conservation work. I asked them about their motivations. What do they get out of volunteering? And why do they think places like the Lower Derwent Valley are so important? 
Well, I, I guess I wish you know places like this were on everybody's kind of doorstep, really, because it's just a, such a fantastic landscape and it's just full of uh, diversity. It's a beautiful pocket of Yorkshire. It's, it, we're in the Vale of York here, and, and I live in York City Centre, which is beautiful. It's a beautiful city to live in. But you look out your window and you see other houses, people, cars. That's, the sounds of towns and cities, usual, you know, sends everybody else that lives in a town or city. And then you come out here and all you can see is life. And it's so beautiful and diverse. And what about the future of the reserve? What challenges are looming on the horizon? I think there's several challenges we face sort of there environmentally, uh, not just with national nature reserves. Uh, obviously climate change. We're seeing increasing sort of effects of, of climate change and unseasonal weather, if you like, and that's having an impact on both the wildlife that we see, but also managing these sites, and that's creating one or two challenges. I think the other big challenge we've got is really re-engaging uh, the wider community with wildlife. You know, getting children out there, getting them playing in it, and making them feel safe in it. And, and really kind of inspiring that future generation of naturalists who are going to look after these sites and value them and, and maintain them for future generations. That concludes our introduction to National Nature Reserves and has hopefully given you a taste of what happens on the Lower Derwent Valley. But there are many more reserves out there, encompassing different habitats. They're managed for the nation, a public good, so you should take the opportunity to visit. Don't just sit there, get your boots on. Till next time.